Genesis chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now here in the middle of this extremely familiar story to most of us, what we essentially see is the most catastrophic poor decision ever made in the history of humankind. And yet, immediately following this catastrophic mistake, we see the presence of the Lord God walking in the garden. That there was no mistake too great to keep him from coming down and visiting with his people. And what we have to understand is right now we live in a season of time where God's presence is always with us, where even when we make a mistake, even when we reject him, even when we go our own way, that there he is in the middle of the mess, there he is in the middle of the moment, his presence is around us, and he's speaking to us, desiring to draw us in and draw us back to a place where we are in communion with him. When we find ourselves and making a decision that just looks to separate us from God. Could we have enough sense, even in the middle of a very poor choice, to run back to him? Because God is always there. As we talk about, as we have this conversation where we look at ways where maybe we could stop being so stupid, may we never forget that even in the middle of our ignorance, he is there. Even in the middle of our rejection of him, he is there calling us back to him. And so let's just kind of look at this from, from the beginning, I guess. We see this moment where the serpent shows up to Eve. And he says to her, did God actually say that you couldn't have any tree that is in the garden? I want you to realize the devil knew exactly what God said. He wasn't confused by what God said. What he sought to do was take what God said and distort it so that he could manipulate the mind of Eve. Like, that's what he does with us. He comes, and when we know the word of God, he takes the word that we know, and he twists it and distorts it so that with the word of God, he might cause us to lose the battle in the, in the mind. This is his entire purpose. The devil's sole purpose is to distract us from walking on the path that God has for us that we might choose death instead of life. That is the whole reason why he's there. Jesus said he came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his whole point. His point is not to illuminate. His point is not even to answer questions. Do you think he actually cared what her answer was? Do you think Satan was seeking to learn something from Eve? He, know, he knows the word that God has spoken. We see this in Luke chapter 4 and verse 9. The devil appeared to Jesus to tempt him, and he said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. That this is what the enemy said to Jesus. Hey, it is written. We also see this moment where there were a a collection, a community of devils that had taken residence in a man. And when Jesus came into the presence of that man, these demons began to be very um, afraid of what was going on. We're told in James that even the demons know that God is God and they tremble. They began to be afraid at the presence of Jesus and they cried out to him. In Matthew chapter, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, 
He says, what have you to do with us, son of man? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Do, do you think they knew something that the devil didn't know? No, they knew he was the son of God. The devil knew he was the son of God. The devil just wanted to tempt Jesus. Did Jesus know he was the son of God? And so when they said, are you here before the time to torment us? They even know that the time is drawing near. They know that their time is being cut short. We see this in the book of Revelation. When the devil was thrown down in the middle of this moment, it said he was angry and he went with a greater velocity at the earth. Why? Because he knows his time is short. And we need to be aware that he is coming at us with, with more evil than he has ever come at us before. But please understand this. It's not because he is getting stronger. It's not because he has created more. For he is a created being he cannot create. He does not have the capacity to make more evil. What he can do is he can distort and he can deceive us and we can introduce more evil into the world. Satan isn't getting stronger. We are just becoming more deceived and so more of him is being seen on the earth. See, I, I want us all to realize before we get too far into this, yes, we are told that he was the most clever, the most cunning of all of God's creations. In Ezekiel chapter 28, he was called the signet of perfection who was put in the Garden of Eden as a guardian angel to guard what was going on in that. Like, that was his purpose. It said he was blameless. He was perfect before iniquity was found in him. He was an absolutely beautiful, amazing creation of God. But he's not God. God is omniscient. That means God knows everything. Satan doesn't know everything. But here's what Satan does know. He knows what God has said he, God, is going to do. And he wants to try and stop that. He knows exactly what God has said he's going to do for you. And he wants to stop that. Let me just say, the devil, no matter what he does, he can't stop what God has decided God is going to do on the earth. He's not powerful enough. He is not strong enough. He can bark, yell, roar, do whatever. He's not going to stop God's hand from moving. But here's what happens when God says to us that he will do this for us if we will do this. What Satan seeks to do is distract and deceive us so that we won't do the thing that God has said we must do before God does the thing that God says he will do. So Satan desires to keep us from experiencing the fullness of what God has promised us by keeping us from walking in the steps that God has laid out. Because if Satan can deceive us where we're not on the path of God, what happens is there are no promises of God on this path. They're all over there. And we have to get back to that pathway where the promises of God are found so that we can experience those promises. And so the whole purpose, his whole purpose is to deceive us away from what God has promised us. And so this is what he does. He looks at Eve and he says, is that what God actually said? I wonder how much of the word we know. Like if, if somebody said, did God actually say that to you? Like there are times when I'll say, oh, no, no, this is, we're not going to do that. It's wrong. Why is it wrong? Uh, somebody said it was wrong. Yeah, but what did the word say? I, I don't know what the word said. Well, we can't stand on the gospel we don't know. You can't stand on someone else's word. You, you have to stand on the gospel word. One of the things that I've noticed about me, I've gotten into a really, really bad habit right now of I will have things on my news feed and I'll make an opinion of someone else's opinion and I have no idea what the source material was. In other words, somebody said something that I never heard. All I heard was this person's comment on what this person said. And I'll develop my opinion based on this person's opinion, but I never go back and hear what did this person, what did this person actually say? We've gotten into a place where we're that way with our theology, we're that way with our doctrine. We don't ever actually go back to the Word and see what does the Word say. One thing I hope that you do is when I get done is that you go search the Scriptures to see that these things we talk about are true. Do not take my word for it. You go back to the gospel, you get into the word, and you see what the word says, and make sure I am actually preaching the gospel. If my job is to preach the gospel, your job is to make sure I preach the gospel. And then once you find out, I guess he is preaching the gospel, then you do it. 
That's how this whole relationship is supposed to work. And so Satan, he appears to her and he says, is that what he actually said? He wanted to get in her head. This is what he always does. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, the God of this world, talking about Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds, talking about the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. His whole desire is to get in your head. If he can get in there and he can blind you from seeing the word, he can keep you from walking in it. Uh, let me tell you a silly, maybe just a stupid story, and hopefully it'll make a, a good point. Um, this weekend, um, Lucy, she had, she had some stuff going on. She always has stuff going on, and she was supposed to be back at the school at 4 o'clock, um, and that meant I needed to go pick up Claire when school got out, at 3.05, 3.15. I'm not even sure what time it gets out. I'm always late, but I'm always there. So there's, it's, it is what it is. Um, let, me, let me, I will say this though, for some of you younger parents, I'm a very proud middle-aged parent. What that means is we're still in the middle of some very, very busy years. And when I look back and we had kids, when our kids were, were younger, I really felt like this was busy. My wife and I thought when the kids were babies, like, this is backbreaking. This is backbreaking. <laughs> and so for you, you young parents, if you're having a hard time finding margin in your life, in your week here, let me just encourage you, go ahead and figure it out. <laughs> the first place to figure it out is getting your family in church on Wednesday night. Amen. If you can figure out how to do that, and you can do that consistently, then you maybe are gonna be prepared for middle school. But if you can't figure that out, if oh, we just, we just can't get there, middle school's gonna kill you. <laughs> I'm just giving you friendly parenting advice. You can take it, you leave it, it doesn't matter. I'm just trying to help you. Um, okay, so here we are. She had to be back at the school by four, so I go pick up Claire. Then I had to go back to the school that I don't attend, by the way, I'm not in school. I had to go back to volunteer, Ab and I did, had to go back to volunteer in the parking lot at 545 for the football game. Um, because Claire runs cross country, I have to volunteer. I'm not sure how that works, but that is how it works. So I'm there at 545 to volunteer. What time was Lucy supposed to be back at the school? Four o'clock. Four. It's 545 and Lucy comes pulling into school at 5.45. Doors open, all these little cheerleaders jump out of the car and they go running, she's like, hey dad. And I'm like, four, it's 5.45, you didn't tell the truth. And then I see her later and she kind of blows me off and hey, you know, and I'm like, yeah, see, this is what she's doing. She knows she's wrong. I told Ab, I'm like, this is what she's deceiving us. And her heart's just bothering her right now because she's lied to us. She has lied to us. Her heart is convicting her and she can't even look us in the eyes. Did you see how she just walked by without hardly even looking at us? And she agreed with me, by the way. We were in it together. And so the night's over, we go home, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to her tomorrow. I had this whole conspiracy <laughs> settled in my head of what was actually going on. And so the next morning, I said, Lucy, hey, Dad. Um, what happened to 4, four o'clock yesterday at school? You didn't get there until 5.45. She goes, what? I said, I was there, 5.45. I saw you pull up. Can't lie, I was there. She was, yeah, we had cheer practice and dinner on the other side of the campus, and so when we finished, we all hopped in the car and rode to the football field. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> the whole thing that I'd worked out in my head the entire scenario was wrong. And here's the thing. This happens to us all the time. We have a friend who doesn't say hi very nicely, and we think, oh, something's going on. The boss maybe didn't include us in something. Oh, boss, they're against me. Boss, always against me. I'm going to stick it to the man. I'm going to find a way. 
I'm going to sink this project. You, you, they can't do it without me. And we, we just find ourselves getting in these attitudes and we find ourselves acting certain ways because we have created a scenario in our head that is just not true. And the scenario in our head is begun by the father of lies. It didn't come from us. It didn't come from Jesus. The lie came from the father of lies. And he seeks to deceive us. And if he can deceive us, our behavior will actually shift according to the deception. And then we'll find ourselves walking on a pathway that's not going to lead to life, but the pathway will lead to death every single time. And so he says, is that what the word says? And she goes, uh, well, no, what it actually says is that we can't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. And when she gives the answer, it allows the reader the opportunity to know that she was in a vulnerable time. And the reason why we know that she was in a vulnerable time is because this isn't exactly what God said. It was a distorted or a forgotten view of what God said. And this is what happens. The devil knows our patterns. He knows our behaviors and he lies around watching for us to get in a vulnerable spot so he can come and he can actually deceive us. She had forgotten what the actual command was and her paraphrase neglected one of the most important realities of what God had commanded Adam and Eve. And so we see this here in Genesis, let's back up, Genesis chapter two and verse 16. Here was the command. God said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. He said you can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't say you couldn't eat the tree in the midst of the garden. Here's why this matters so much. Because if we back up to verse 9, it says the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't just the tree of knowledge of good and evil that was in the midst of the garden. It was also the tree of life. And so when she had come to a place where she believed that she couldn't have a tree of the tree of in the midst of the garden, she began to neglect going into the midst of the garden. But when she began to neglect going into the midst of the garden, what she also was not doing was experiencing life that Jesus told her that she could have. What Adam was actually doing was not experiencing life that God actually said that they could have. Nobody Nobody sets out to be deceived. Nobody sets out to make the wrong decisions. But what happens is when we stop experiencing life, then we get frustrated, we get bogged down, and then we start looking for substitutions. And when we start looking for substitutions, we will take what is supposed to be life and neglect it, and we will choose what is death. And it doesn't look like death at the time, but it only looked appealing to us because we neglect life. And this is where we have to be extremely aware of the enemy's schemes. It speaks very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. It says that, therefore, if you think that you stand, take heed lest you fall. Now what that means is not that when someone does something wrong and falls, that I don't recognize that, because if I recognize it, then I'm gonna be filled with pride and then I myself am going to fall. It's not what it means. What it means is, don't think you can do the same stupid thing that that person did and you not fall. That's what it means. Like we have gotten into a place in modern Christianity where we are substituting so many of our doctrines and theologies where we're actually elevating a concept of grace to allow us to live in a very poor way. And let me just say, take heed lest you fall. Because our lifestyle should be a lifestyle that is lived in obedience to the gospel of God. We have been given the choice, choose life or death. This is what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. God said, I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your offspring may live. There are poor choices, wrong choices in front of us every single day. We need to act like they're not there. We don't need to ignore them. We need to be aware that they are there, but what else are we aware of? Where's life? Because when God gives us life in front of us, he tells us if you'll choose life, you'll experience life. If you choose death, you will experience death. 
And again, I don't, I don't think any one of us woke up one day and like, you know what? I think I'll blow up my marriage today. You know, I think I'm going to walk into work. And I'm going to let that guy have it. I'm just going to wreck my career right here. I don't, think any, I don't think anybody sets out to do that. What happens, though, is it is one deception after another deception after another deception until we find ourselves where now we step over that tipping point and there is destruction. Why? Because we kept making the wrong choice. When they stopped experiencing the tree of life, Satan found a very vulnerable Adam and Eve. And then he came to get to Adam through Eve and he tempted her in a vulnerable place. She fell. She then caused her husband to fell and to fall, and they made an entire mess of things. Why? Simply because they weren't experiencing life anymore. And this is where, unfortunately, I'm just, I feel like this is where so many of us are living right now. It's like we know a better way but we've made excuses to not live the better way, and we keep thinking that some way this is gonna be life, and we know it's not. We're just, we're just unwilling right now to make the difficult decision to resist and reject evil and choose life. And I, I, see, it, I see it all the time. This, this last week, um, I don't know, it was just an odd, it was an odd week. We had a bunch of events. I was around a whole bunch of people, some people I hadn't seen in a while, some people I had. Like, you're just in this, just season of life where you're really busy all the time. And so I'm at one event and um, talking to a guy, comes up like, hey, how's it going? Like, hey, how you doing? And we're just talking and I realized like within 30 seconds of the conversation, this dude is like drunk. It's five o'clock. Who's drunk at five o'clock? Okay, I know we're in church. You're not supposed to get drunk, period. But I mean, just if we could ignore that for a minute. Who's drunk at five? Five. And his wife's kind of ignoring him because it's like, you know, I don't know what he's doing, you know. And you're watching this whole interaction. I'm like, this is not good. This isn't good. I'm at, a, another, I'm at another event and I get seated and I sit down and this couple's in the middle of, of infidelity and you know, you've heard about all this, the stories, because people talk, people all talk. And you're sitting there and she's looking one way and he's looking another way and you're like, oh, this is super uncomfortable. The Lord is good. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, what, do you, what do you say? What do you do? It's just like, ah. Then I'm starting to get aggravated because there's a devil loose. And he's blinding the minds of not, not just unbelievers. He's blinding the minds of believers so that the good that they know to do, they don't do. And the evil that they don't want to do, they're doing. And you're just watching this whole thing unfold in front of you. I'm at another event, like a day later, two days later, whatever. And there's another, hey, how's it going? Hey, how are you? And you start talking and... They haven't served alcohol where we are and you're drunk and it's nine o'clock. So you've been here for two hours and you're like, that's, I'm thinking you got pretty far over to still be drunk by nine. Am I the only one? Talking just stupid. And you're like, this is, this is who we're becoming. This is, these are, these are the people who we are becoming. I'm in another place, another event, talking to somebody that the, the last time I knew them, they, they were, they were a woman. And now, now they, they dress like a man and they have a new name and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't, I'm like very conflicted in my soul. Like, I don't know what to say here. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I don't want to be rude, but this, I'm just, I can't go along with this. And you, you know, sometimes like, well, Sean, you know, you probably should be a little more easygoing about stuff like that. But let me just say this. Let's just talk about name. Let's do a sidebar. You want to do a sidebar for a minute? Yes. Let's do a sidebar. Um, God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Did that matter? Yes. yes, it mattered. He was Abram. God changed his name to Abraham. Then we have Jacob. And God cha changed Jacob's name to Israel. And then, then we have Jesus look to Cephas and say, Cephas, I call you Peter, because on this rock, 
I will build my church. Did it matter that he called him Peter? Yes. And then we have a man named Saul who was ravaging the church. He was going against, he was putting people in prison, he was having people killed. And under this name, he was doing horrific things. And then he has a transformation, a moment of transformation on the road to Damascus. And Jesus literally changed him from the inside out. And then Saul changed his own name to Paul so that he would be a, a, an apostle to the Gentiles. Like, he changed his name. Did it matter that he changed his name from Paul or from Saul to Paul? Yes. Did it matter that G Jesus changed his name from Cephas to Peter? Yes. That he changed his name from Jacob to Israel? Yes, that he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. I just want you to know it matters. If it matters, then in that name, when you, trans, when you are transformed to a new you, a better you whom God has called you to be, and he gives you a new name, that new name unlocks all of the life that God has placed and called you to be in. I want you to see the name matters. Within that name, there is all of the life that God has planted for you. But if you resist and reject his way and you choose a new pathway and you decide to rename that new pathway a name that leads to death, I guess what I'm saying is I'm just not willing to speak death over somebody. I'm just not willing to do it. And as Christians, we are constantly in this generation being put in positions where our faith will either stand or our faith will fail. And I just want us to be aware that the enemy is seeking to lie to us. He's seeking to deceive us. He's seeking to take the word of God and actually distort it. But if we will spend more time with the giver of life, we will have our ideas, we will have our lifestyle, we will have our thoughts renewed to the glory of God. Because when we choose Jesus, we choose life. Jesus said it this way in um, John chapter 14 and verse six. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. There isn't a softer gospel. There isn't a more maybe liberal gospel. There, there isn't a different gospel. There's just the gospel. And we're called to stand on the gospel. We're called to know the gospel. We are called to declare the gospel. We are called to live by the gospel. So that when the enemy comes and he seeks to distract us, we will not be led astray. Let me just say it one more time. It is impossible for us to live like the world and not eventually experience the same destruction that the world is experiencing. We cannot flirt with the other side of the balance sheet. We have to stay on God's side. We can't go, there was a river that ran through Eden. And on one side of the river, there was a tree that was forbidden. On the other side of the river, there was a tree that God says, I want you to come to me. This is why Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You've got to go to the tree. you got to go to the place where God has called you to be. you got to go where there's going to be life. Because on the other side of that river is death, and it's always going to be death. But on this side is life, and it's always going to be life. Life today is life forever. Let me wrap it up with this. Um, the best friend of Jesus, um, he, he had a moment where Jesus had already been sacrificed and resurrected. All the other apostles had already been martyred. And he was on an island, isolated, 
experiencing these wonderful visions from God. And I want, I want to make a very stark point here. Um, because an angel appeared to him, and he did something because of the beauty of that angel that he should not have done. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 9, it says, John said, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. But the angel said, you must not do that. For I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with all those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. We can never fall down to worship the promises. We can never fall down to worship the gifts. We can never fall down to worship the things we want the most. We just fall down at the feet of Jesus to worship Jesus and him and him alone. And when our worship is ascribed to him only, we experience the fullness of the life that he has promised us. For in the world there is death, there will always be death. But in him there is life and there will always be life. So I just want to encourage you today, choose life.